Hi, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. This episode is going out on Thanksgiving Day 2018. If you're in the United States, you're probably eating enough food for five people right now. If you're outside the United States, I'm almost positive you have familiarity with the American holiday of Thanksgiving through movies and everything else. And you've at least seen the stereotypical image of people crowding around the table to eat an enormous amount of turkey. Something I want to touch on in this episode isn't the origins of Thanksgiving, which are somewhat well understood, even though they can also be very well misunderstood. But I want to look at another aspect of Thanksgiving, and that has to do with the bird itself. A turkey has the same name as a country of turkey. Is that a coincidence? It's not a coincidence. There's a similar origin for the name of these two. But the common origin that these two have isn't just a small historical trivia fact, but it's actually a vast story about global trade and a new age of human connection that began 500 years ago. That's what this podcast episode is going to be about. The idea for this episode, the commonality between the name of the bird and the country, came from Chris Grayton, who is one of the hosts of the Ottoman History Podcast. He also explored this issue on an episode several years ago. Chris looked more at this question from the perspective of the Colombian Exchange and the history of the Ottoman Empire. I'm going to look at this more from the vantage point of the bird itself. So this connection between Turkey the bird and Turkey the country tells us a huge story about the age of discovery that, among many other things, brought the pilgrims to Plymouth Rock in 1620. And it also tells us about how confused people in the old world were about people in the new world when they discovered the original inhabitants there. And one of the reasons that we call a turkey a turkey, the bird, is because even though indigenous Americans had little to do with the old world, this didn't prevent people in the old world associating people and things in the new world with the Middle East, India, and elsewhere. So first off, let's begin with terminology. So the word turkey, which came first, the bird or the country? Well, the country came first, and more specifically, the people who gave the country that name came first. When we talk about Turkey or the Turkish people, which comes from the medieval Latin Turkus or the Greek word Turkos or the Persian word Turk, that term can go all the way back to 177 BCE with the Chinese word Tukin which described the people living south of the Altai Mountains. The Persian word Turk could also mean a beautiful youth or a barbarian or a robber. Chinese sources use the phrase Tukui going back to the 6th century, and this transliteration could have originated for the word Turkut in Turkish, which meant powerful, but later on gained other meanings such as youth, brave, or mature. Another hypothesis of this word is that goes back to the word turuk, which is a derivative of the word ture, which means something like law or tradition or cultural norm. Turuk could be used to denominate people who abide by customs and traditions. So this could be a catch-all word that described people that lived in a general region and over a very long time could have evolved into Turk. All right, so that's the ancient meaning. And then if we look from the vantage point of Europe, there's also a long tradition of calling the Turkish people Turks. The word Turkey, which is used to refer to land occupied by the Turks, goes back to the 1300s. It was used by Chaucer in the Book of the Duchess. And the word Turk, it seems to have entered Western sources from the East and was used in Italian, Persian to refer to people of this region. The land occupied by the Turks and many other people was known as the Ottoman Empire, which lasted from 1300 until 1922, but Westerners commonly referred to it as Turkey. And following World War I and the fall of the Ottomans, the Republic of Turkey formed, and they took the name that had long referred to the region, so Turks live in Turkey, and that makes sense, right? Now, in their own language, Turkey is called Turkiye. And many Turkish people realize that the name of their country is the same as the bird. And for decades, officials in Turkey have tried valiantly to internationally change the name of their country from Turkey to Turkiye, so it's not the same as the bird. For a long time, academics and officials, when they would send papers to international conferences, they would say that they were at a university, for example, in Istanbul, Turkiye, and not call their country Turkey, but Turkiye, and change the English usage. The plan didn't work. I worked at a newspaper, in fact, in Istanbul as an editor of the English language website. 
And the official style guide was to not call their own country Turkey, but Turkey A. And I told the editors, look, I get it. You don't like it, but you're not going to change anything. You're just going to confuse people. But hey, I was a lowly peon, didn't change the official style guide, and the quest continues. All right, so the place called Turkey came first. The Ottoman Empire was called Turkey well before anyone knew anything about the bird. Because the bird is from the New World, people called the Ottoman Empire Turkey before they ever knew of the bird. So what is the connection? Well, the bird we eat on Thanksgiving is an exclusively North American animal. It doesn't exist in the wild on any continent but North America, and it evolved here. So why is it named after a Eurasian country? According to Mario P., who was a Columbia University professor of Romance Languages, he spoke on this topic in an NPR interview in the 1980s, and he says it has to do with when a bird from the New World arrived in England. So he had two theories. First, in the 1500s, when the American bird first arrived in Great Britain, it was shipped in by merchants in the East, mostly from Constantinople. These merchants brought the bird over from America, but they were the ones who actually brought it to England. And since it arrived wholesale from the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey, as British merchants called it, the British referred to it as a turkey cock. That's partly because the British weren't particularly precise about products arriving from the East. Persian carpets from Iran were called turkey rugs. Indian flour was called turkey flour. And even Hungarian carpet bags were called turkey bags. Hungary at different times was part of the Ottoman Empire, so this is why. And at different times, the English called all Muslims Turks. And before that, they called them Saracens. And well into the 20th century, they called Muslims Mohammedans. So Muslims have always been mislabeled. Although, to be fair, in Arabic, sometimes Muslims are just called believers. Iman or Mumin. So the confusion goes around in all sorts of languages. Anyway, if a product came to London from the far side of the Danube, Londoners called it Turkish or Turkey. And that's what happened to the American bird. It was incorrectly associated with the East, and that's why it was called that. So one theory is that the American bird got the name Turkey Cock, which was then shortened to Turkey. Another theory that Professor P. mentions is that long before Christopher Columbus came to America, Europeans already had a wild fowl they liked to eat that came from Guinea in Western Africa. It was a Guinea fowl that was imported to Europe, also by Turkish merchants, or at least merchants from the Ottoman Empire, and it was eaten in London. So it got the nickname Turkey Cock because it came from Constantinople. And when British settlers got off the Mayflower and saw their first American woodland fowl, even though it was larger than the African Guinea fowl, they call it by the name they already use for the African bird because wild forest birds like that were called turkeys at home. So a name attached to an African bird got reattached to an American one. So this bird, which originated in America, was ascribed to the Middle East, even though there was no connection there. And what makes the story even stranger is that people in different countries in their own languages each give it a different name and they ascribe to this bird a different homeland, none of which have to do with America. And let me explain. In Arabia, they call the bird Dikindi, or the Indian rooster. In Russia, it's called the bird of India. In Poland, it's also called a bird from India. And in Turkey, they call it a Hindi, which again is something from India. And that's bewildering because Turkey, which has no native turkeys, they knew the bird wasn't theirs. So they made their own mistake and called it a Hindi for different reasons. Maybe the original merchants mistakenly thought it was from India. Or maybe it was due to Christopher Columbus calling the place that he landed India, or the West Indies, which the area of the Caribbean in which he originally landed, is still called the West Indies. All this geographical confusion is getting attached to this bird. And the confusion extends to other languages. The French originally called the American bird Poulet d'Indy, Sorry for the bad French pronunciation, but the literal meaning of the name is chicken from India, which has since been abbreviated to dindi. There's the specific Dutch word, kalkoin, which is a contraction of Calicut hen, which literally means hen from Calicut or Calcutta, a major Indian commercial center at the time. 
This could have arisen from the mistaken belief at the time that the New World was the Indies, or the sense that the turkey trade passed through India. This North American bird was never given its proper Americanness. Now, one explanation of why the turkey wasn't associated with America is because Europeans who first encountered these animals in North America rarely encountered them in their domesticated form or in their livestock form that they would see later. They encountered them in their wild form. Andrew Crosby describes in his book, The Columbian Exchange, Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492, is that Renaissance Europe was shocked in the contrast between old and new world fauna. To Europeans, the Indian as a farmer was impressive as any in the world, but he was unimpressive as a domesticator of animals. There simply weren't as many domesticated animals in the new world as the old world. And Jared Diamond argues in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, one of the main reasons why the New World was simply at a disadvantage in building up civilization compared to the Old World because its animals couldn't be as easily domesticated. There were only a few domesticated animals, like the llama and alpaca in South America, and a few different kinds of fowl, like the turkey, the muscovy duck, and possibly a type of chicken. So there were some domesticated turkey, but almost all of them existed in the wild. And in fact, most of his meat and leather came from wild game. There was no beast of burden to be compared to the horse, the donkey, or the ox. So the turkey was mostly wild when it was first encountered. It's not the plump, massive turkeys that you see in American agribusiness today. And since this is a Thanksgiving episode, we need to talk about the presence, or the lack thereof, of turkeys at the first Thanksgiving. Were they even there? That's part of the iconography of Thanksgiving. But when the pilgrims first stepped off the Mayflower in 1620, in December, Finding a turkey wasn't on their list of things to do. Thanksgiving wouldn't be invented for another year. The first Thanksgiving probably would have contained waterfowl, ham, lobster, venison, clams, berries, fruit, squash, and pumpkin. If the turkey had any meaning to the early explorers who came to North America, they would have seen the bird as a sign of nobility because that's what the inhabitants of America ascribed to it. Centuries before Columbus reached the New World, Aztecs had domesticated a bird that we called a turkey, but they called the huexolotl. The turkey was so important to the Aztecs as a source of food that some Indians regarded it as a minor deity. There were two religious festivals a year in the turkey's honor. Now, turkeys back then are different from turkeys today. Wild turkeys could run at up to 30 miles per hour. But modern-day turkeys are bred for size, not speed. And a turkey has a reputation for stupidity because it moves around so slowly, and some can barely move around at all. But wild turkeys had a reputation for craftiness. North American Indian tribes regarded the turkey as a powerful spiritual symbol. They prized breast feathers as an alternative to goose down for warm winter wear. Southwestern tribes thought the turkey to be the guide that ushered the dead into the next world and buried their loved ones in turkey feather robes. Someone else who famously considered turkey to be a symbol of craftiness and intelligence was Benjamin Franklin. When Franklin was the United States ambassador to France, he received a newly minted seal of office. It had an eagle on it, but the eagle was said to look more like a turkey. However, Franklin approved this choice because he said, I am on this account not displeased that the figure is not known as a bald eagle, but looks more like a turkey. For in truth, the turkey is in comparison a much more respectable bird, and withal a true original native of America. He is, though a little vain and silly, it is true, but not the worst emblem for that, a bird of courage, and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards, who should presume to invade his farmyard with a red coat on. When the Spanish arrived in the early 16th century, they didn't even know what to call the bird, and they settled on a kind of peacock with great hanging chins. The bird gained a reputation among the Spanish as having fine textured flesh and distinguished plumage. They also thought it looked funny. Courts in Madrid and Seville talked about it, and we don't know when the first turkey arrived in the Old World, but it could have been after Columbus's fourth transatlantic visit in 1502, when he visited Cape Honduras. King Ferdinand gave instructions in 1511 that every Spanish ship returned from the New World, bringing 10 turkeys. He said, half males and the other half females 
because I desire that there be bred here some cocks and hens of those which you have there, and were brought from 